Hello, Nutrition 115 students, and welcome to Unit 22 or Chapter 22, Diet and Cancer. Uh, this is a rather short lecture, uh, but I want you to know that I did provide a webcast from the Harvard uh, School of Medicine for those of you that want to learn more about the topic. So um, here we go. So what is cancer? Every any time I ask this question, or any time we hear the word cancer, it's a one of the words uh, in this world that is often feared a lot, and that's because it often indicates um, an extreme health issue that someone has to go through. Um, and it has a spectrum, but again, none of us want to hear the bad news uh, that we have cancer because again, it feels like we have to prepare for maybe death, uh, maybe not, um, but for sure an arduous process of healing and treatment as well. Um, so cancer. Um, Cancer is a quite a complex group of diseases. It's not just one disease, but it's a complex group of diseases. And it's initiated primarily, according to research, um, by acquired gene mutations. So there's this regular way that your um, genes um, duplicate on a daily basis, monthly basis, weekly basis, even from the fetus. So there is a way that we are put and structured together as humans. And it requires certain proteins, and proteins are made of amino acids. So these amino acids are what initiates um, a certain sequence of how something is built, maintained in the body. And if something goes wrong in the sequence of how those amino acids are put together, then we get a gene mutation. Now, these gene mutations can occur over time due to exposure to factors, such as, for example, excess body fat, if you smoke tobacco products. Uh, various components of the diet, um, physical inactivity, certain type of infections and hormones, and exposure to specific chemicals and pollutants and radiation as well. Now, I want you to know that acquired gene mutations also occur randomly during cell division. Some types of cancer, specifically prostate, breast, and colorectal, they do tend to cluster in families. Now, I also want you to know, though, that most cancers, too, however, are not clearly linked to the genes we inherit from our parents. Um, we do have a higher risk of developing a certain cancer, uh, uh, depending on the type and if it has a link maternally or paternally. For instance, if your maternal line, your mother's line, had breast cancer, it seems that if you're a woman, you have a higher chance of breast cancer. Also, current research is showing that if you're a male and you have breast cancer in your maternal line, your mother's line, that you could be possible that uh, you're potentially carrying also the prostate cancer as well. There tends to be a high correlation with that nowadays, okay? So cancer, again, um, a little bit more information is the second leading cause of death in the United States. It used to be very low on the totem pole back in the 90s, and I've noticed in the 21st century it's climbed itself up. Cancer is, again, a group of diseases in which abnormal cells grow out of control, and we talked about how it's from acquired gene mutations, and it can spread throughout the body, not contagious, and has many causes, as we explained, some environmental, some dietary, some genetic, um, um, and so on that we'll discuss. Most common sites for cancer development are the lungs, colon, prostate, and the breast. However, there's others that you've heard of, for instance, I recently had a, uh, an acquaintance that died of uh, bile duct cancer, which is a very rare cancer that is not uh, well researched as of yet. Okay, and then brain cancer, there's other types. Approximately 40% of the US population will develop cancer at some point during life, so that's a huge percentage. So it only makes sense for us to get educated and learn more about prevention. Now, what is cancer continued? I just want to note that in your book, you have this image. This is straight from your book. And it's just an illustration regarding the percentage of new cancer cases by sites and sex. And about 23% of deaths in the U.S. are due to cancer. Okay, so it's a high percentage. Um, let's go on. So how does cancer develop? I want you to know that it begins with DNA. Uh, DNA is made of proteins or amino acids. The genetic material, the DNA is the genetic material in cells that controls the body's production of proteins that regulate cell functions. They become damaged. Again, we get a mutation. Now, DNA can be damaged by reactive oxygen molecules, and these um, reactive oxygen molecules are extremely unstable in the cells, and they're called free radicals. 
radiation, toxins, and other reactive substances within cells. Um, now, I want you to know, um, before I go further, let's uh, explore some of this stuff on your slide. So cancer, again, I explained it's a complex group of diseases initiated primarily by acquired gene mutations that are influenced by different things like diet, physical and activity, environmental factors, certain hormones, and even genetic factors. These mutations occur over time due to exposure to factors that I just mentioned and I put here. Excess body fat, tobacco smoke, various components of the diet like a low intake of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and a high intake of saturated fats, uh, physical inactivity, certain types of infections and hormones, and also the exposure to specific chemical pollutants and radiation. Cancer development uh, does not proceed in a straight line. It can progress two steps forward, then take a step back or two back. And it can have this really irregular, irregular pattern, just so you know. Uh, some people develop cancer and they uh, recover from it and it never happens again, it never reoccurs again. And then some people recover from cancer and then um, they continue to have reoccurrences. So everyone's a little different. How does cancer develop? Uh, so this is according to your book. Um, it has an image, um, it's a very layman's term image about how uh, DNA has to be repaired actually in everybody's body and uh, certain harmful factors um, it, that contribute uh, to this DNA not being repaired um, in the, uh, the time that is supposed to be allotted for your body to remain healthy if the damage continues in a prolonged manner. Uh, what happens, it can possibly initiate cancer or in, in the DNA. So, for example, toxic environmental contaminants and other chemical agents, viruses, exposure to radiation like x-rays and oxidative stress, abnormal hormonal changes. Um, so, an example of oxidative stress is if you live in, if you are someone that maybe likes to live life on um, on the beach uh, where it's like 80 to 100 degrees a year round, um, you can develop skin cancer over time if you expose your skin to the UV ray lights, that oxidative stress of the sun. Um, and again, uh, if you repair it, um, we're gonna talk about diet right now and other factors like being active, you can repair some of that DNA, but if, if you are don't repair that DNA over a prolonged period of time, uh, promotion of cancer can occur, okay? And it says here the lag time, lag time is 10 to 30 years. Um, and then if there's no repair, um, or you, you continue to not prom, um, incorporate um, treatment, um, treatment steps and strategies to help maintain it and um, possibly reverse some of the damage, then repair can continue. And we get this uncontrolled growth and spread of abnormal um, cells. And again, we call it malignant. When you hear the word malignant, it means that the cancer is active um, and it's, it could, it's spreading. Um, and if it's benign, it means that um, the doctor has, or medical staff has indicated abnormal tissue um, that was possibly cancerous, like a tumor. But when it was tested through a biopsy, um, it, the cells were tested, um, it proved to not be cancerous, okay? So how does cancer develop continue? The risk of cancer uh, develop begins with DNA becomes damaged, like we explained. And I also want you to know that about 80 to 90 percent of common forms of cancer are related to environmental factors that modify the structure and function of DNA. So many of us should start thinking about how we can change our lifestyles, what kind of dietary and other lifestyle factors like being active can we incorporate to decrease this, okay, and also considering where we live. Um, the, I want you to know poor diet, excess alcohol intake, and obesity are the three important environmental factors accounting for about 30 to 40 percent of cancer risk. So when we talk about having a cancer risk or a higher risk, um, usually we, um, we're saying here that for 30 to 40 percent of that higher risk accounts for having a poor diet, excess alcohol intake, obesity. Okay. Um, I also want you to know that I've met people that have had extremely healthy lifestyles and have had breast cancer um, and have um, died from it. And I've met people that have had an extremely healthy lifestyle. Um, I'm talking about well-rounded and have actually recovered from breast cancer and the reoccurrence factor because they continue to be healthy has not come back or is very low, okay? Um, it's still a, a, a 
group of diseases that is being studied because it's quite complex and complicated. So I want you to know that even though we have some information about treatments, um, it's still, uh, we're still in the infancy stages, okay? I also want you to know that a genetically based susceptibility to cancer can develop even in a fetus during pregnancy and in infancy. For example, exposure to calorie deficit, certain viruses and other specific substances during these periods of rapid growth and development can actually modify the function of genes that help protect people from developing cancer later in life. Um, so again, the DNA can be damaged by reactive uh, oxygen molecules and uh, we get these unstable molecules in the body called free radicals due to the damage uh, that we have been exposed to or expose ourselves to, um, radiation and toxins as well. Once the structure of the DNA is altered, it changes the accuracy of how the DNA codes for protein synthesis or the making of proteins in the body. This situation can lead to a phase called the initiation phase. Um, and then cancer development enters, if it enters a later stage, it's called the promotion phase. If damaged DNA is allowed to accumulate over the course of years or prolonged period of time. Now the initiation phase, I just want you to know the start of the cancer process. It's a very early stage and it begins when the DNA starts to show damage. And this is the, 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 the stage that if you can identify it medically or clinically, you want to. Um, and what I, what I mean by this is make sure that you go to your regular doc, physical doctor visits every year if you're younger and you discuss with your doctor as you get older some of the cancer risks in your, in, in your history um, and you want to review that in your history. Now the promotion phase is, happens later, it's at a later stage when we talk about a more advanced stage. It's the period in which cancer development when the number of cells with altered DNA increases. Okay, and this promotion phase can have spectrums. It can be very severe when we catch it. It can be a little bit more moderate. Okay, but we're talking about it's the cells are duplicating now. So again, I mentioned this that about 80 to 90 percent of common forms of cancer are related to environmental factors that can modify the structure and function of DNA. And here are the ones that I just explained earlier in the previous slide. So the poor diet. These three factors account for um, 30 to 40 percent of cancer risk. When we say that people have risks of cancer, of developing cancer in their history, um, in their background, it's due to these factors. When we look at environment, the environmental category. Some people have genetic predispositions towards cancer if regularly exposed to certain substances in the diet or environment. For instance, if you smoke a lot, even if you don't smoke and you secondhand smoke because you live with someone, um, you are being predisposed for that, from that secondhand smoking. And this is from your book. Uh, so it's telling you the nine leading modifiable risk factors related to cancer development. Where well, so if you wanna know more about um, in general, what are some fact, risk factors in our life that we can modify um, in order to decrease our cancer risk um, that can eventually damage your DNA? These are some of the things that we can take a look at. So like managing our weight, obesity, um, low intake of vegetable and fruit. So if that's you, increase your food, fruit and vegetable intake. If you're not active, make sure you're active. If you're smoking, um, consider stopping. Um, and if you live with people that are small, consider moving out of the environment. Um, or finding some alternative lifestyles uh, to uh, decrease the smoke, secondhand smoke in your life. Um, if you drink alcohol, again, consider stopping or uh, drinking less, um, having unsafe sex, air pollution, and so on, okay? So fighting cancer with a fork. Let's talk about, um, as far as diet, how it influences uh, cancer. So I want you to know that specific characteristics of dietary patterns linked to the development of cancer include what we just saw. Uh, so specific to diet is having a low intake of vegetables, fruits, and whole grains, and regular intake of charred meats. Uh, red and processed meats, foods and beverages, high in added sugars, and excess alcohol consumption. So just not the, the charred meat that you see here. Um, and also, if, uh, for those of you that want to learn more about cancer and diet, I did provide an optional webcast that's about an hour long from, the again, the Harvard School of, um, of Medicine. And I would I recommend you take a look. They'd also talk about meats and a little bit about um, 
uh, what meat does in the body at the cell level that is harmful in regards to cancer. So for those of you, um, um, if you ever heard of meat, if you over um, cook your meat um, or if it's coated like the coals, there are certain carcinogens that are released into the air and also can be consumed by the body. Uh, so we're talking about those harmful toxins called carcinogens that are developed as uh, when meat is charred. Fighting cancer with the fork. So here are some things that you can do. So I want you to know that foods contain a variety of vitamins and minerals, as well as the fiber component and phytochemicals that help prevent damage to DNA or assist in the repair. So make sure that you guys uh, view the lecture on vitamins and phytochemicals, which is, are the two former lectures, because they go over uh, what kind of chemicals uh, foods include, the phytochemical, and what kind of vitamins um, can help ward off certain diseases like cancer and how important they are in fighting oxidative stress in general. So straight from your book, I might ask you this on the test. Um, these are dietary patterns and lifestyle related to reducing your risk of cancer. So things that you can do is you can eat five or more servings of, of a variety of fruits and vegetables daily, including varying them from green, dark green, orange, and red, um, including fish and seafood and chicken throughout the week, excluding charred meats, excluding excess alcohol intake, excluding smoking, maintaining normal weight, and so on. This is straight from your book. So how do healthy patterns help prevent cancer? Um, I would want you to know that, um, again, it's in those vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and how they interact with, uh, with our cells at the cellular level. Um, foods contain a variety of vitamins and minerals, as well as fiber and phytochemicals that help prevent damage to DNA or assist in the repair. And a lot of them do it by donating electrons those subatomical particles that you guys learned about in chemistry. So these unstable molecules or free radicals that are produced in your body from oxidative stress, they, are, they have unpaired electrons and they become very harmful. So in order for them to uh, reduce um, how they damage certain cells in our body, they are searching for other electrons and from other cells to steal in order to become stable again. And vitamins, minerals, um, and phytochemicals, not really fiber, but um, they have electrons that they donate to these uh, free radicals in order to stabilize themselves. So they have a paired amount of electrons, okay? Uh, so that's how they, uh, just in a nutshell, how they assist. Plants reduce cancer risk by their antioxidant and anti-inflammatory functions. They prevent DNA damage as well as help in the repair of DNA. Many brightly colored vegetables and fruits contain phytochemicals that act as antioxidants. And we learned about the antioxidant term in the last, last lecture. So make sure that you view the phytochemical lecture. We talked about how phytochemicals are against um, oxidative stress. That's why they're called antioxidants because they're against that oxidative stress. And I go through the process of how that happens. So make sure you view that lecture. I also want to mention that the colors of a lot of fruits and vegetables, as you see here, this is from your book, um, phytochemicals um, and vitamins are, are responsible for giving them their colors. For example, a lot of your red um, vegetables like watermelon and tomatoes, it's uh, a phytochemical called lycopene that's responsible for giving them that red hue or red color. Um, and also like vitamins like vitamin A, is responsible for giving fruits and vegetables those nice orange and yellow colors. Now this is straight from your book, so I want you to just uh, take a look at these colorful vegetable and fruit antioxidant sources. I do want you to know for the test, I do want you to know about cruciferous veggies, which you see here in the middle box. Um, cruciferous vegetables or cruciferous veg veggies uh, contain broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, spinach, watercress, turnip, greens, collard greens, cauliflower, and they're called cruciferous because uh, they have this crisscross-like shape in their leaves uh, when they're growing as plants. But they have very powerful antioxidant properties in regards to cancers, many kinds of cancers, especially breast cancer. Um, not only do they uh, appear to turn off genes that promote the oxidative stress and inflammation that can damage the DNA, um, uh, but they also have other things like decreasing risk overall before you even get the cancer. So if you have these high risks, it can decrease risk. And if you've had breast, if you've had cancer in general, um, it can decrease the damage uh, to the body, and also it decrease it can decrease reoccurrence as well if you recover from cancer. 
bogus cancer treatments. So uh, the ending of your book has this little reality check uh, discussion about bogus cancer treatments. I do want you to know because cancer is on the rise and it's a very popular topic and on the minds of many Americans. There are, all, there are also people that want to profit off of certain dietary fad diets. And here are some. So cancer is again a fear disease which leaves cancer prevention and treatment open to fraudulent claims. An orthodox Treatments not proven to work include the following that you can often hear. Um, macrobiotic diets. Now, the macrobiotic diet has some good features in regards to phytochemical properties in general and incorporating more plants in your diet for more vitamins and minerals that are powerful antioxidants for the body. But I did go over the macrobiotic diet and it's about not just eating, but also has a spiritual component. It's also about achieving balance in your life. And they encourage to eat regularly, chew their food extremely well, listen to your bodies, stay active, maintain a perky, positive mental outlook as well. And they incorporate a lot of whole grains, vegetables, and beans are the mainstays of the diet, which some people believe can prevent or treat cancer. But I want you to know that while the American Cancer Society stops short of recommending the macrobiotic diets to prevent cancer, because there's no scientific evidence, it does say that researchers believe eating a plant-based, low-fat, high-fiber diet lowers the risk of, of heart disease and some kinds of cancers. Now, there is another, can uh, another cancer. There's another diet called the DASH diet, D-A-S-H. And I would actually recommend uh, the DASH diet. Um, it was now recently approved um, um, to be used for cancer patients. But before you do anything, again, if you have a medical condition, you have to Work with your doctor first before you consider any recommendations in this lecture or from anyone else. Bogus treatments uh, should not be used as a substitute for evidence-based approaches to cancer prevention and treatment. Always check with your doctor and work with your medical team clinically.